this song from some time ago. Haven't sung it in a while. I love the message in it. God, I felt like that might be up the pole for tonight. Amen. We'll not be defeated anymore, and it fits right in with my message tonight. If you have your Bibles, you'd open them. Exodus chapter 17, <clears throat> beginning of verse. I'm going to skip this one, and I'll tell you the reason why. There are some names in there that are about as difficult to pronounce as anything you've ever seen. So you don't really need to see those names. <laughs> but start at verse 2. At least I'm honest about it. A lot of preachers, you know, they'd, they'd be sitting there, and they'd be trying to pronounce them and can't pronounce them. I said, oh, Lord, I'm just going to have to jump over. Verse 1 to verse 2. Exodus chapter 17, beginning of verse 2, and the King James text reads, Speak unto the children of Israel that they... Turn and encamp before Pehoroth, between Midgal and the sea, over against Bilzephon. Before it shall, before it ye shall uh, shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Did you hear that? Read something about water and everything. Did you hear what I said in verse three here? I'm sorry, verse four. And I will, far, uh, will harden Pharaoh's heart 
that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon his host. Mine does. Okay, I haven't even gotten down to four yet. No, I said start at verse two. Yeah, right here. Okay. He said, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, and the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this? that we have let Israel go from serving us. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pehethroth before Belzephon. And Pharaoh drew nigh. The children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Now listen to what they said to Moses. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? Let us die alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Master, we thank you, God, today for your word. We thank you, Lord, today for the ability to come into the house of God and to give you thanks and praise. Master, as we come into this place, we need desperately tonight to hear from heaven. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost, God, to quicken our lips of mortal clay that we might speak that which the Spirit would speak unto the churches. Lord, for those in this building, for those that will hear by tape, those that will hear over the internet, we pray, God, that this message will be a powerful message of liberation for them, helping them to break through, God, all the barriers that the enemy would place before them in their spiritual life. Master, grant it today, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. I'm going to talk to us about how soon we forget, and I'm told that it's chapter 14 that I read, not chapter 17. Yeah. Okay, I've got it written down wrong here in my notes. So Exodus 14, 2 through 14 is what I read from the King James text. Look at the experience that Moses is having with the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 14. Here they are standing at the banks of the Red Sea. They haven't really gotten very far in their journey out of Egypt. And the Bible said that God had already told Moses, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh so that he is going to chase you. Yep. I'm doing this. You wonder sometimes when negative things are happening and bad things are happening, God says, I'm doing this. I have a reason. I have a plan. There's a purpose in this that I'm trying to serve. He said, before it's all said and done, I want the people of Egypt to know that I, 
the Lord God Jehovah, the God of the Hebrew nation, is the only God that lives and reigns supreme in the land of humanity. I want them to know that I alone am God, and beside me there is no other. And it's one thing for me to have embarrassed their gods through the plagues in Egypt leading up to your release, but now I have yet one further action that I want to uh, bring about in order to establish my prominence. So I want to not only leave your enemies behind you, I want to drown them. I don't want them to even have life in their body anymore. Not only will you be leaving Egypt behind you, but the armies and those men who for many, many years had captivated you and held you captive and held you slave, I'm not even going to allow those men to live and breathe on the face of this planet anymore. I'm going to annihilate them and wipe them off the face of this planet on your behalf. But in order for God to do great things sometimes, we've got to be put in some scary places. Amen. Come on now. In order for God to be able to do great and miraculous things, sometimes we've got to be in some put to horrifying places. Here the children of Israel were. They have just been released from Egypt. They haven't walked very far. All of a sudden they realize, you know what? We're locked in. The Red Sea is in front of us and Egypt is behind us. And look, in the distance I see dust. It's the chariots of Pharaoh coming after us. Yes, amen. Oh my God, what a horrifying place to be in. What a scary thought. What a fearful place to be in. But you see, God can't do big things unless we step out in faith sometimes and let God do big things. The good thing is God told the leadership, don't sweat it because I'm in it. Amen. He told Moses before it happened. He said, I'm telling you now that Pharaoh is going to come after you. I'm telling you now that this is going to happen. Why? Because I want him to. I want that dirty dog to think he's going to come after my people and bring them back into captivity. I want him to think that he's going to be able to bring my people back into a place of slavery. I want him to think that he's so powerful he can do anything he sets his mind to do. And then I'm going to prove he isn't and he can't. Right. But I want him to think it. Yes, amen. So he told Moses long before it happened that it would happen. So Moses was forewarned and he was advised in advance, Pharaoh is going to come after you. But you know, in verse 4, it was interesting how that God gave the warning to Moses. To Moses. He said, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Amen. That I am the Lord. He said, I want to make certain that the Egyptians are well aware of the fact that I'm the only God up here. And beside me there is no other. Amen. When we look for when we look further into the story, looking down at verse fifteen through twenty, I love what I read there because it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Moses had gone to God and said, Lord, you know, your children are crying that we're uh, we're here and, and there's nowhere for us to go. And we're in a place that uh, we're bound to be destroyed. And what does God turn around and say to Moses? Why are you crying after me? Why are you coming to me and yelling at me about this for? We've already had this conversation. I already told you. When it's done, you're going to be the victor. When it's done, you're going to win the battle. When it's done, you're going to win the war. Why are you coming after me and complaining already? And it was because of the voice of the people of Israel that Moses was complaining to God. And saying, Lord, we're going to die here. And the Lord said, what are you coming to me? Complaining, I, we've already had this discussion. I already told you, I'm the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I did this so that I could prove that I am God and God alone. And nobody in Egypt is going to misunderstand it when I make my final point. Amen. 
when I put my exclamation point at the end of this sentence. But now listen. So the word starts out saying to Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes the, God speaks to the pastor and said, Didn't I tell you one day this thing will break through? Didn't I tell you one day you're going to have victory? Didn't I tell you one day that there's going to be great things happening and you're going to be part of what I'm doing? Why then are you coming and complaining to me? Talk to the people, hallelujah, and tell them, Let's move forward, glory to God. Let's not stand still. Let's just set our eyes ahead and continue to march. Amen. Glory to God. And then he says, But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Wow. So God's telling Moses, All you've got to do is divide the sea. Notice God didn't say, I will do it. Yeah. Okay. Let me read it for you again. Verse 16. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. Mm -hmm. Children, if we knew the power God gave us half the time, we wouldn't stand around complaining and fearful and fretting. We would just turn our faces toward the ocean. We'd, take, we'd lift up the rod and we would call on the name of Jesus and we'd watch the sea divide. Amen. You see, while we're so fearful and nervous, God says, I've already endowed you with power. I've already given you supernatural ability. Don't you remember when you stood before Pharaoh and how that you would drop that cane down upon the ground and it became a serpent? And then they matched your trick with their trickery. And then your serpent ate their serpents, and you picked her up by the tail, and once again it returned to a staff. He said, don't you remember when I gave that staff to you? I gave it to you as a, uh, an article of divine unction, an article of divine action. It was something that I gave you to use when divine action was necessary. Well, baby, quit talking to me about what you need. I'm telling you, you already got what you need. Just pick up that one and divide the Red Sea so the children of Israel can cross over on thy land. God says to the church today, quit arguing and barking and fighting with me. I've already given you the Holy Ghost. I've already given you Jesus' name. I've already given you the power to overcome. Don't look at me and expect a miracle. Make miracles happen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. I don't care how dire the circumstance looks. God's already given us the ability to overcome. He's already given us the ability in the end to come out victorious. Listen to this now. He said, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, see God isn't out of the equation. He's in it, but listen to how he's in it. He said, I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. <laughs> well, Lord, couldn't you make our job easier instead of harder? <laughs> so what you're saying is, while well, we're running across on dry ground, those bunch of fools are going to chase us right behind us. Is that what you're saying? Yep, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Are they going to do it because it's the devil? No. They're going to do it because it's me. Yeah. Because I'm going to put it in their heart to follow you. I'm going to put it in their heart that they're so mad that these people were there trying to escape slavery in Egypt. I'm going to put it in their heart to come and try to retrieve you. Amen. Well, gee, Lord, okay, just so long as it's easy. <laughs> Just as long as it's you know, a nice, simple process. So we can't just walk across the dry land. We better run like a bunch of fools. We can't just kind of meander on across. You know, we better run like our lives are dependent on. Is that what you're telling us? Oh, yes, that's what I'm telling you. 
See, Tommy, sometimes God don't make it easy on you. He doesn't make it easy on us. But there's a reason and a purpose in what he's doing. Because when he's done and it's all finished and it's all said and done, people are going to look and say, look what God hath wrought. And nobody's going to say, look what Mola did. Nobody's going to say, look what Thompson did. Or look what Burnett did. They're going to look and say, honey, God had to do it. I saw what those people went through. I saw the obstacles they faced. I saw the trouble and the struggle and the hardship. And yes, they still today have a giant victorious church with people jumping out of wheelchairs, being healed, and people being delivered from AIDS and HIV and it's all because 10 or 15 years ago they held on when they were facing the banks of the Red Sea and they believed God when every circumstance seemed to be working against them and God was making it even harder by telling the Egyptians now chase them go away <laughs> <laughs> now listen to this the Lord said I will harden the heart of the Egyptians that they shall follow them and I will get me on her he said I'm going to pull on her out of Pharaoh if it kills me upon Pharaoh and upon all his host upon his chariots and upon his horsemen and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. But now listen to this. Get ready for a goosebump attack. Because this is going to get you. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel. You remember the Bible says he led them by a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud by night. Listen to this now. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel, oh Lord help us, <laughs> removed and went behind them. Oh my God, do you remember me talking to you before about God being our re reward? He said, I'll take care of the back. You worry about the front. Hallelujah. All you got to do is worry about getting the cross for it. I'll hold these people in place until I want them to come into that cavity. Right, oh, my Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, God will lead you till he needs to guard your back. Then he'll move. Hallelujah. And he'll get behind you and he will watch your back. But listen to this. I had not even got to the goosebump part yet. <laughs> Listen to this. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it became uh, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. But listen to this. And it was a cloud and darkness to them but it gave light by night to these, meaning to the Jews, to the Israelis, so that the one came not near the other all the night. So God was on one hand holding back the children of Egypt by causing them to be in a fog and causing them to be overcome by darkness when in the middle of the night his rear end was on fire. Hallelujah! And it was providing light for all the children of Israel so they could see their way across the Red Sea. Oh, don't you tell me God can't be the Father and the Son at the same time. And he can be darkness on one side and light on the other. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, boy. That was the goosebumps. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. He was able to keep one side in darkness and on the opposite side <laughs> provide enough light. Think about it provide enough light to illuminate enough ground so that one 
and one half million people could march through the Red Sea. The Egyptians are behind them, but they're held back by this darkness, by this cloud, which was the pillar of cloud that God had sent for the Egyptians. He was no longer in front of them. Thank God God knows when to get behind us. Thank God God knows when to get in behind us. When we cannot guard and protect ourselves, he's there to guard and protect us. He leads us when we're able to follow and when we're safe to follow. But he gets behind us, baby, when he needs to guard us and watch out for our best interests. So he's blinding the Egyptians with darkness and a cloud and his backside is just ablaze, which is providing illumination for a million and a half people. How can you have that much fire and not have it illuminate both sides? Hmm? How can you be the dark side of the moon and the light side of the moon at the same time and be able to literally cause such a darkness to fall upon the Egyptians they can't see where they're moving so they don't move an inch. They stop dead in their tracks and they wait. And while they're waiting, God's people are marching, a million and a half of them, across the Red Sea. I've been to parades in New York City. I've seen parades where they say that there might have been maybe 100,000 people marching in that parade down Fifth Avenue. And I'm going to tell you, it is a tour to get all them floats and all them people and all those things moving and flowing and keep them moving down the street. And when it's all done, it takes hours and hours and hours and hours, sometimes six, eight, eight, nine hours for that entire parade to pass down Fifth Avenue and to go down a tract of approximately 30 city blocks. Now imagine that parade route Instead of it being Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, New York City, imagine it being through the center of the Red Sea. And instead of the buildings on either side being businesses and stores, imagine it being a wall of water being held back by nothing more than the command of God. Can you imagine how many people want to stop and mess with it? Well, look at here, Gertrude. I can just put my hand right in the water. Look at it. It is just miraculous. Oh, my God. Can you? Can, come on now. You know we got a bunch of retards in this life. Everybody, people must have been looking and gawking. Nobody just walking through to be walking through. No, no, no. Everybody wants to look. Everybody wants to gaze at this miracle. Everybody wants to see this great thing God's done. And they're gawking around. And they've got ox carts. And they've got carriages. And they've got all these things, uh, devices trying to carry housewares and clothing and all these things from their homes in Egypt. And they're trying to get all this through the Red Sea. Days. Days God kept the children of Israel in darkness. The children of Egypt in darkness and the children of Israel in light. For days God did this. That's how long it would have taken to get all those people through that passageway. You see, folks think, well, how can God be the Father and be the Son? Honey, how can God be lightness on one side and darkness on the other? My Lord, have mercy. He can be whatever he wants to be, whenever he wants to be it. Hallelujah. Is it not better, we think, to stay in one place, never taking a chance, never investing in tomorrow? Why should we step out in faith to follow God? I'll tell you why. Because he has promised us a far better place ahead than lies behind us. But when the tribulation fires burn and trouble faces us head on, suddenly like the children of Israel we scream, wouldn't it have been better if we had just stayed in Egypt? But how soon we forget just how hard the life in Egypt was. 
slavery we think all of a sudden is better than freedom. Yes, to some that may be true when you consider that freedom comes at a cost. Right, amen. A lot of people say, well, all the grief and all the trouble and all the struggle that your ministry has gone through over the last 13 years, is it worth it? Is it worth all the aggravation? Is it worth all the trouble? Is it worth all the stress? Well, I don't know. You haven't lived my life and I haven't lived yours. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'd rather have the life I'm living today than the one I was living 15 years ago. And if your life can't, if you can't sit down and take an account of your life and see that your life is in a far better place today than it was five years ago before Jubilee came to Dallas, Texas, and if you can't see that and acknowledge that and realize that, then maybe you're in the wrong place. Because the reality, my friend, is the devil wants you to suddenly look back at Egypt and say, Oh, it was easier before. It was better before. I could have done more before. I could have accomplished more before. Below me. Amen. Below me. Well, I put so much money into the church that I don't have money like I could have. I could have saved money to bought me a house or bought me a Lincoln or gotten me a diamond ring or something. Yeah. Let me refresh your memory of how you would have spent that money if Jubilee didn't come into town five years ago. You'd be out every weekend with your four little drinking buddies buying rounds. And by the end of the night, you'd have gone through anywhere from seventy to a hundred dollars, and you know it, and I know it, and God knows it. And you'd have been wasting your money on fair weather friends who are only there when you're there to buy a drink for them, and when you're not there to buy a drink for them, they don't want to know nothing to do with you. And if you went into the hospital tomorrow, which one of them, which one of them do you want me to call to come see you? Tell me what you could have done if, 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 if. And I'll tell you, the devil blinds us to the reality that slavery stunk. Amen. That living a life of unbelief and living a life without a knowledge of God stunk. That we weren't blessed. That we weren't under God's hand of protection. That we weren't under God's hand of blessing. That the Lord wasn't touching our life and leading us in a new direction and helping us to live a better, cleaner, sober life. What about the loneliness? I don't know about you, but there was times in my life I went through some miserable, horrible, hideous times of loneliness and despair. Yes, Oh, it's so easy to look back and say, oh, everything was better then. How did we go off in Egypt? I should just go back to the same slave where I came out of. I should go back to the same situation I come out of. Go ahead, you dummy. You want to go, go. But you know what? I'm not dumb enough to believe the devil's lies. I know better. I know what's back there. You know what, Tommy? No matter how you slice it, if you're a slave, you're a slave. I don't care if you're a house slave or you're a field slave, you're still a slave. Amen. And your soul and your body are not your own. You belong to somebody else. You want to go back to being a slave to your old habits? Go ahead. Go back to being a slave to your old habits. I will just, I'm not talking just about drinking and drugging. I'm talking about your old spending habits. You want to go back and spend the way you used to say, go ahead, go do it. We forget when we come out of Egypt that God loaded up the children of Israel. They, the, the Egyptians were so terrified of God's people. By the time the plagues had all come through, and by the time that the eldest son had been killed by the death angel, they were so terrified. They were begging the children of, uh, of Israel to leave Egypt. And they were giving them all kinds of jewels and gold as bounty. You forget when God brought you out that he blessed you. You didn't come out broke. You didn't come out poor. 
You're not suffering. You don't have to sit and wonder where your next meal is going to come from. You don't have to sit and wonder how you're going to be able to pay your rent this month. Oh, but you know what? I could probably do this, that, or the other thing if it wasn't for the church and for what I'm doing for the church and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's be honest and quit talking junk and let's be honest. How did you spend your money before you started coming to church? Oh, I was a saver, right, Tommy? You had at least a million two in the bank, I know, when I met you. I was a saver! Oh, yes, the church has completely cost me my ability to save any money. Oh, really? And how many years before this church came along... Did you not have a savings account worth a hang? Come on now, I'm telling the truth tonight. You hear what I'm telling you? Because you're just the same kind of spender you were then as the same kind of spender you are now. And you can sit here and lie like a dog to me all you want to. You ain't going to tell me no different. I know better. You know why? Because I know me. Oh, yes, amen. The only difference is I'm not going to sit here and try to act like I'm something I ate. I'm not going to sit here and say, bless God, I put so much money into this church and why well, you used to have a banking account with thousands of dollars. And no, I'm not. I've never have been a big saver. I've never been really one that was good at saving money. I'm just telling it honest. But see, that's what humanity doesn't want to do. That's why we look back at Egypt and say, oh, we'd be better off in Egypt. We'd be better off to go back to slavery. We'd be better off to go back to the way things were. How soon we forget. Was it really that wonderful back then? Is your situation really so terrible today? Is it really so miserable today? Are your circumstances really so hideous today? I remember a time in my life where I, I mean some tough, tough, tough times where I had days that passed and I didn't have any groceries come my way. And I'm hypoglycemic, and you all know how I get with my blood sugar getting low. And I mean, oh man, I used to be messed up. I remember some very difficult and dark times. Now in some ways, back in those days, certain things were better. For instance, sometimes back in those days, I was preaching almost every weekend somewhere. I, you know, I was being invited to preach all over the place back in certain time. But, but as far as having money for falling out of my ears, I didn't have that. Because I've always preached wherever God opened the door for me. Whether it be a little church like this one or a great big church, didn't matter to me. If they invited me, I went. If they gave me $20, I took it. If they gave me $500, I took it. Whatever they gave me, I took it. I've always been a person of principle more than brains, I'll tell you. My principles will win every time. Somebody invites me to come preach on a little church somewhere. I don't think twice about it. I'll put gas in the tank, and by the time I get out there, they give me a love offering that doesn't even pay half the gas I had to pay to get out there. But you know what? I can look at my situation today. I don't like it. I feel like I'm kind of pinned in. I kind of feel like I got the Red Sea on one side of me and I got the Egyptians on the other side of me and I really don't care for it much. Yep. But you know what? God didn't bring me this far to leave me. Right, amen. He didn't take me this far so he could let me down now. He didn't amen. He didn't get me to this point so he could disappoint me today. No sirree, baby. I've got enough faith in God to believe that if he brought me to this place, he has a purpose, he has a plan, he knows what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing always, but he knows what he's doing. And I guarantee you that in the end, just like he said to Moses, when it's all said and done... He is going to glorify himself in it. Yes, amen. That much you can bet on. Amen. And you know what? When I came into ministry years ago, that's what I signed on for. Lord, in my life, I don't want to be glorified. I don't want anybody, I don't care if anybody knows my name when I die, but be glorified in my life. Yes, amen. Let you be glorified in my life. That's what I signed on for when I came into ministry. And you know what? God will give it.
He'll glorify himself if you make yourself available to him. He'll glorify himself in your life. Just like he said to Moses, he said, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But the reason for this is, I'm going to glorify myself. I'm going to get them Egyptians to recognize something. That all their gods of gold and brass and silver and wood don't amount to a hill of beans. That the only God in heaven is the Lord uh, God Jehovah of the Israeli people. And they're going to know that. They're not going to think it might be possible. They're going to know for a fact that it is so. Why? Because what was the final deity character? What was the final deity in the Egyptian setup that God had not yet totally embarrassed and brought down to planet Earth by reason of the plagues and all that? What was the final deity that needed to be unseated? He did that with the red, the the, uh, the waters of the river turning red as blood. The Pharaoh. The Egyptians believed the Pharaoh was a god. They deified the Pharaoh. Oh yeah. So God said, "I'm gonna drown that sucker in the Red Sea." And he's going to have all his power and all his might, which is represented in his armies and in his chariots and in his horses. He's going to have all his power and all his might at his right hand, and he won't be able to do one bloody thing. That's right, amen. And then when I'm done, the Egyptians are going to know I'm God. Right. And beside me there is no other. Amen. And I'm here to tell you today, whatever circumstances we face in our life, if we'll be honest for a minute and we'll be truthful, and if we'll look seriously and honestly, we can easily recognize, Mother, that we're in a whole lot better place than we were when we came into this thing. Amen. Amen. It's not a one of us can't recognize we're in a whole lot better position and a whole lot better situation than we were in when we came into this thing, right, there's not a one of us that's going to be able to say God hadn't pulled our fat out of the fire. Amen. Time after time after time after time Amen. after time. Yeah. Well, you know what, Tommy? If he's done it before, he'll do it again. Amen. So instead of getting negative, instead of getting faithless, instead of getting down mouth, what we need to do is say, okay, Lord, we're waiting. You've done it before, you'll do it again. You've done it before, you'll do it again. That's all we got to do. Is approach it with that kind of an attitude. Say, Lord, you've never failed us. Stand with me. There's a chorus that says, I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. You've been so faithful. You've been so true. You've never failed me, though I failed you. I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you. You've been so faithful, you've been so true, you've never failed me, though I failed you, I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you. Master, we thank you, God, tonight for this message. Lord, it's so wonderful to know that in every circumstance, in every situation, you're in control. Whether Pharaoh's armies are behind us, it doesn't matter because God between them and us is you. Hallelujah. And while you blind their eyes, you provide light for ours. Master, in the name of Jesus today, we just pray that you would illuminate our minds, our hearts, our eyes, our ears. Help us, God, to understand it. And deliver tonight. God inspire faith in our heart to believe you. Lord, you provided for us so many times. And Lord, we know you're going to 
provided him because you're a faithful God, because you're a God that honors faith. When people step out in faith and believe you and trust you, and tonight, God, we have no other hope outside of you. We trust you, we believe you, God. Oh, Jesus, today, inspire faith in the heart of every hero, God, today. Inspire faith in the heart of every hero tonight, God, in Jesus' name. Let your words go forth after it is out of the So we ask it in Jesus' name. We will to God in the name of the Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. 